Um, and so I always record these so that we have a record of them and it goes on our NOISE website. Um, one of the things that I ask you to do is, I have some just blank paper here. And so if everyone got, uh, Amy, I don't know if you got a piece. Hunter, did you get a piece? Okay. Um, for all of our professional development workshops, when we have speakers, I ask you to do, I call this a connections grid. Um, and part of that is that we want to see what connections are you making to the speakers that we have come. And so things that we are looking for, and we want you to think about while um, we have our speakers, is what are like any personal interest connections that you have to the topic that we're talking about? Um, what are some maybe connections to your content area, whether it's science or math? Kind of thinking, how is this information that I might use in my classroom? Um, and then, how is this connected to social justice issues, which we face every day with our students in the classroom, or for you personally? Um, and then, how is this relevant to a place or location? And when you look at this, you can think about, is it associated with a place that I want to be teaching? Or is it associated to a place for you right now? Because maybe you're working in classrooms right now as part of your practicums, and you can associate with that. So it's kind of really wide open. Um, and you don't have to write complete sentences or anything, bullet points of, yeah, this is what it sparked in my brain as I was listening. So feel free to that, and we'll gather up those at the end. So it helps us as people who are putting on the professional development to say, oh, what connections are people making, and what other kinds of um, speakers should we invite? All right. So without further ado, Danielle. Thank you for having me. Yeah, we really, so I really appreciate the opportunity to chat with you all. My husband is a middle school science teacher in the Thompson School District, so I have that connection. Oh so gosh, where is he too? He teaches at Loveland Classical. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, so I don't know anything about science, but I'm going to do my best <laughs> to connect, right? Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about me so you all can feel connected to where I come from and how I entered into this work. And also, feel free to ask questions. I want this to be as interactive as possible because this is your time and your information. I'm just happy to share. So I'm a licensed clinical social worker. I teach in the School of Social Work alongside Liz. I also have a private practice and do clinical supervision. And I'm also a licensed addiction counselor. And so that's really where I got into my work around the opioid epidemic and just addictions in general, is I historically have been connected to the Northern Colorado AIDS Project, and they do lots of research and lots of services around addiction. And so that's when it, what got me really interested and got me going with the opioid epidemic. And it hit our community, of course, and I, we needed to respond. So what we're going to do today in our time together is talk about what are opioids. There's a lot of myths, and we're going to dispel those hopefully right away. Um, why it became an epidemic, why we have the opioid epidemic nationally, what's happening locally, and we won't go over everything, it's just enough information for you all to feel like you have what you need. And then how does this epidemic affect us as teachers, right, in the schools? How does it affect us working with students? And we want to make sure that you have that information so you can provide the resources. So first things first, I always, as a social worker, I am filled with disclaimers. And when we talk about addictions and we talk about the opioid epidemic, it's a lot. It's a lot for people to take on. We all have different relationships with substances, family histories with substances. Our society has a whole framework around what we are supposed to think or not supposed to think about substances and judgments that are all connected to those things. None of that's right or wrong. It just is in our world. And so I like to say that because there's a lot that comes up for people. And often we don't know where to put it when we start talking about addictions. But I want to put it on the table and I want to say it's okay that we talk about it. I just put this flyer in there, talks a little bit about my work. I'll be happy to share this presentation, however you need that. That'd be great. And we can get that posted. This just shares a little bit about other opioid epidemic presentations we've done here at the school. But first things first, as you all are teachers, <laughs> we've got to get everyone engaged. So has anyone done Kahoot? Yeah. So we're all going to do it. 
So, everyone get out their cell phone. Everybody. I was like, I am ready. <laughs> <laughs> Love Cahoots. And make a, a fake name. So let me get to our screen. I don't want, we don't want real names. We're not having a competition. We are having an educational moment that's filled with lots of myths that are set to get us going. And let me get you the number to code to log, log in here. So do we go to Kahoot? Yep, you'll go to Kahoot just on the internet. No need to have the app. Okay. And it's all, it's getting ready to join. It's going to give us. Oh, that's a lot. misconstrued or misunderstood. So be prepared that it's okay, we're not going to get all of these right, because it, they're very complicated and, and we get messaging around them all the time in our day-to-day -day lives that tell us that these myths are true. And we're going to dispel some of those myths. <laughs> Excuse me, yeah, do not log in, just click play. And then you'll enter this code. You would log in if you want to create one. I'm not being a good person. Yeah, you can create anything you want in a code. But yeah, just make up a name, anything fake. So we're not having a competition. We're just learning, interacting. Um, I just <laughs> this stuff was all just coming out when I was teaching. I know. Are we all in? I think we're all in. Oh, we're waiting for Mike. Okay. The students, of course, teach me about these things. So. <laughs> And then the questions should show up on your screen once we get logged in, so it's hard to see. Emily, would you be willing to help Mike? Let's see if we can get it logged in. You seem to be an expert. I can already tell. She, <laughs> she looked at me like, I get this. Okay. I've never done it before until um, recently either. I've usually done it from the other end. So when I get to play, I'm like, what? What? The, what's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So we're going to have 11 questions. And we're going to go through, I'll say the question. You'll have to put your answer in pretty quick. That's a little bit of the tricky part about Kahoot. And then we'll talk about it. Then I'll kind of explain the myths you know, and the facts. Are we ready? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. It's going to be fine. Okay. It's, I'm going to read it as well as it's going to say it up here. Opioids are stimulants. So you're going to say myths are triangles, facts are diamonds. So opiates are stimulants, myth or fact. Diamond is fact, triangle is myth. Can I say that? All right. See, it's very confusing. So opiates are depressants. They're depressants. They slow down our central nervous system. So um, often, you know, opiate or depressants are alcohol. They're marijuana. They're opioids. Stimulants are often methamphetamines, cocaine. It's just important to understand that. So are they like endorphins? Like your body's endorphins in a way? 
or chemically similar? Yeah, yeah, they're produced in our brain, and it's just how our body reacts to that, and it just slows that central nervous. So we have lots of natural opioids as well. These are more of the synthetic. Okay, next one. Opioids is an umbrella term for opiates. Opioids is an umbrella term for opiates. Myth or fact? Myths are triangles, facts are diamonds. Thank you all for participating. <laughs> I know. See, it's so confusing. So opioids is an umbrella term for opiates. So historically, opiates are naturally found um, derivatives such as heroin, morphine, codeine, those are the natural opiates. And then the synthetic opioids, the kind of newer that we see these days are fentanyl, methadone, Demerol, we'll see some of those in surgeries and those kinds of things. And fentanyl is 50 to 100 times stronger than naturally occurring morphine. So it's really, really important to understand that. Semi-synthetics exist as well, which again would be under that opioid title. Hydrocodone, oxycodone, those are medications you might get after a dental surgery, or something like that. But we need, they created then this umbrella term as opioids to cover opiates that were naturally <coughs> and opioids that were synthetic and the semi-synthetics. And so it was, it was necessary to find an umbrella term to cover all of it. But technically, there's differences, but if you're, that's why it's called the opioid epidemic, right? Question? You ready? All right. Narcotics are different from opiates. Myth or fact? Narcotics are different from opi opiates. This is tough. So narcotics are not different from opiates. So they, narcotics are drugs that remove pain. That's kind of the definition. And opiates are a subcategory of that. They just remove pain. But it's very confusing because we hear stimulants, we hear depressants, we hear narcotics, we hear the narcotics unit. And it feels like all these things are siloed. But there's a lot of overlap in the terminology, which makes it confusing for us to Ask questions if you have them. What was? Oh, never mind. Okay. Let's just close. All right. Poppy seed muffins can make you fail a urine test. Myth or fact? I put this one in just because I usually am asked. They can. They can make you fail a urine test. Don't you have to eat like a ton of them? No. <laughs> Interestingly enough, you don't. Really? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And so that's, I mean, yeah. I was sure that was a myth. I, I, I know. Thought, I thought, me too. I like, thought somebody said you had, I know there's a time there, frame. Time is more of an essence than, I mean, quantity. But honestly, a muffin could do it if the time is right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good to know if you're looking for a child. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Don't eat a poppy seed muffin yeah. before you have to go take your test. So <laughs> It did happen to someone, someone saying, oh, that happened to my father-in-law. So, yeah, it's not without the realm of reality. <laughs> All right. Next one. Opioid addiction should not be treated with more medication. It should not be treated with more medication. Myth or fact? Yeah. 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 Oh. yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. So, yep, it should be treated with more medication. It should be in the sense of medical assisted treatment combined with behavioral therapies, which we'll talk a, a very briefly about, but we'll go into that a little bit. Just because I feel like it's important for y'all to know. Codeine is not an opiate. Codeine is not an opiate. Myth or fact. We said that already, right? Codeine is an opiate. 
And this is often what we, we see sometimes in high schools is um, students will take cough medicine with codeine in it. And it's actually very much in, so, in the social, culturally accepted and talked about a lot in music. And so you'll see that there. And students get caught with this pretty frequently. I feel like my mom made me cough medicine with codeine in it. Opioids can be ingested, smoked, <laughs> absorbed dermally, or through the bloodstream. Opioids can be ingested, smoked, absorbed dermally, or through the bloodstream. Myth or fact? Nice work. So yes, they can be ingested, such in a pill form that we hear about, maybe with some of the medications we talked about. Absorbed dermally might be those fentanyl or demerols often come in patches for pain. Um, smoked, of course, depending on all different versions, and through the bloodstream it can be injected that way as well. Overdose on opiates is not possible when smoking it. Myth or fact? Opioid, oh, overdose on opiates is not possible when smoking it. Yeah, so it is possible. It's about tolerance. It's about a lot of other things besides that route of emission. As we know, how it gets into our bloodstream does vary but it can, it doesn't necessarily matter. Overdose can happen. And there, that could be a myth out there. So. Opioids, even when used as directed, can enter into the substance use spectrum. So into a substance use disorder or the substance use spectrum. So we'll talk about that language. We're doing a lot of um, language before we're there. Myth or fact? Yep. So we know that um, individuals can be placed on pain medications for a short amount of time for a very reasonable reason and take that and then become um, physiologically dependent on that substance of overnight. And that's a lot of the stories that we hear in, in my line of work is I was in a car accident, I was hurt, and then I needed to take pain medications and the pain just wasn't being managed, wasn't being managed, kept going, and maybe I didn't have access to that anymore, and then I switched over to using heroin or something like that. And it goes that quick, and it's actually that normalized. Um, and that's a typical story that we're going to hear. In Colorado, it is illegal to possess syringes without a medical prescription. In Colorado, it is illegal to possess syringes without a medical prescription. Tricky. So in Colorado and 16 other states, there are exemption laws for those engaging in a syringe access program or like a public health program. So it's not illegal in Colorado if we're engaging in that. That one's a little tricky. But it is not in this state or this county. So it's county by county in Colorado, and in this county it is not. So, because I've had syringes for my dog. Sure. That's diabetic, and I don't have to have a prescription to get them. I can just go get them. Yeah, nobody does. I have to have a prescription. Yeah. Yeah. But the individuals that are often targeted, um, and a lot of that going on, um, don't have to have a prescription either. But they, they can have an exemption card, if they're being kind of asked questions or, yeah. But yeah, for many of us, they wouldn't ask us. Naloxone is harmful if administered in a non-opiate overdose. And I know we haven't learned about this yet. Naloxone is harmful if administered in a non-opiate overdose. So naloxone is the medication that's an agonist. It, agonist. it stops the drug attaching to the receptors in our brain, just knocks the drug right off the brain, the opioid, which is amazing. EMS is carrying this um, most places and definitely here in Larimer County. And it is not harmful if given if there was an, another kind of an overdose, such as a stimulant overdose. And you're unable to assess what, what's going on.
going on, but you know it's an overdose, that person wouldn't be harmed. It wouldn't reverse their overdose, it wouldn't um, change that for them, but it would not harm them further. So that's just a myth that we hear. I feel like I've recently heard a story, and my guess was on NPR, because that's some of the only radio that I have on when I hear news stories. Yeah. Um, like, and I don't know if it was here in Colorado or somewhere else, that they were trying to get schools to keep, what is it? Naloxone. Naloxone at the yeah. school. And so one school had, you know, a couple doses of it mm -hmm. and said, really, this is not where students need it, but that it's needed, you know, more when they're out in the community. Yeah. And so they said, we don't know, like, if this is really great for us to have, like, if it's an expense that is just expiring and we're not using it. It's like, yes, it would be great if we needed it here, but this is not where we think we need it. Yeah. In Laramie County, we have a peer program, basically getting at what you're saying. There's a peer peer education training program, so people can come and get information and education, and then they get to take that and have it with them. They carry their naloxone when they're at home or around peers or maybe a mom worried about um, their son or something like that. So, yeah, there can be that peer-to-peer, -peer, and that's exactly what you're getting at. Like for me as a professional, it doesn't always make sense, but it makes sense to, to teach the people that are at home or there when overdoses happen. It's interesting. There we are. And the ram, of course. <laughs> nice work participating with me before you had all the information. I really appreciate that. In the presentation that I'll send over has all the, the data, the facts of that Kahoot. So you can feel free to look at that. So again, interject if you have questions. Addiction basics. We've already kind of touched on this. But addiction, we can't talk about the opioid epidemic if we don't talk about addiction in general. There's this historical social construction around addiction that's laced with the moral model <coughs> and choices, right? And that's just how our society and the understanding of addiction is throughout time. We know the research, and that's everything that I'll share with you today, is only just research, is the research says there is a disease connection, a brain connection, and there's a biopsychosocial connection to addiction. So there's a lot more to it. There's an intersectionality of things happening, and the newest research, which there's not enough yet, is really around the social piece of addiction, which will be interesting to see where they go with that. But the idea is, so say someone, someone's addiction is cookies. You know, you're just, that's your thing, right? And then your, uh, your way of treatment is like, oh, wait, here, have some spam. It, it just doesn't really work like that. And so that's a nice analogy that, to help us just ground us in the fact that there's this brain, social, physiological, and all these connections still exist in our socially constructed society with the moral piece. So then there's so much shame connected around use and addiction and the opioid epidemic, of course. So, of course, all of us have soapboxes. Here's <laughs> our relationship. All of us have relationships with substances, like I said at the very beginning. We have one. They exist, whether it's family stuff, friends stuff our construction, societal things, around use. It's important for me to not assume or know that I have any understanding of that grounding for each and every one of us, right? And that's important for us when we work with people or students. We just don't know. We don't know the history. We don't, what's, we don't know what's happening at home. We don't know what's happening with parents. And so the foundation is that. So language really, really matters in the classroom. And that'll talk a lot about when we talk about your role as teachers. It's first, we want to do per, people first language. We try to want to, instead of say drug users, you know, someone who uses drugs, a person who uh, uses drugs. We need to be really, really mindful that those stigmas kind of further create the shame and disconnection of people opening up, feeding the isolation and feeding kind of the dangerousness of the opioid epidemic around overdose and death. And so there's lots of stigma and marginalization with individuals who use substances. And there's, we kind of perpetuate this isolation and shame. So the quote up here is nice. I won't necessarily read it. But
So we'll do national opioid epidemic, Colorado, and schools. So national, we understand from 1999, this is when things really started to change, to 2016, more than 630,000 people have died from a drug overdose. That's just overarching. You can see the map also brings it to light. And then on average, 115 Americans die every day from opioid overdose. Of course, landing it in that epidemic category. There's other stats for the state in general. And here are this picture shows the different drugs. And um, fentanyl, you can't even see. And carfentanil, which is often a tranquilizer, you can't even see at all. And it's just minute amounts are extremely dangerous. So what happened? Why did the opioid epidemic start to begin? And again, me being a social worker and kind of seeing, seeing things through all lenses of systems, is it's not just one thing, as we know with humans. But that it, there's an intersectionality of events that occurred to kind of create the opioid epidemic to get up and running. Part of it, and, and just don't, when you leave here, it's, it's not one thing. So I really want you to hear that. It's not one thing. It can't just be the pharmaceutical <coughs> companies. It can't just be policies. It's, it's a lot of things. But there is a piece of pharmaceutical companies, right? There's a piece of healthcare providers and the fifth vital sign around pain and how we've been managing pain since 1999 and kind of the changes. That is changing back. And so that'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Drug policies play a role, socioeconomic factors, of course, all of these things play a role. The systems of society, it's not one thing, it's a multitude, a multitude of things in different ways that created this to occur. So then the risk factors for overdose, leading again to the opioid epidemic, is for you all to understand, the poly substance use is a big contributor. So if people are using one depressant, say such as alcohol, they use another depressant, say opioids. They're playing on the same receptors in the brain, and that is how people can die of an overdose, right? That's one way. Changes in tolerance. So as you build in tolerance, um, maybe you don't even see it coming, right? And that's often what we hear. And then maybe you have to go to jail. Or maybe you want to you wanna not use anymore, and so you stop using. And then you relapse, as that is part of the process but you relapse at the same rate you were using, your tolerance couldn't handle that, and we overdose, right? So there's a lot of reasons we overdose. Fentanyl is, in my opinion, okay, you can take that one. That is like pretty close to the top of the list of why overdoses are the way that they are. It's being um, put into a lot of medications and people are using it more accessibly than in, ever before. Um, obviously there's other reasons, previous overdoses, using alone, that isolation piece, then we can't have an naloxone, route of emission, of course, age and health. Our heart is a big role as well, and we won't always know that ahead of time. So here in Colorado, I think these stats are really important to understand as well. Colorado um, record, recorded 912 overdose deaths in 2016, more than any previous year. So you see the trajectory from 1999 of overdose deaths. So non-opiate and opioid or the other colors. And the one I really want to point out, there's more than, that's more than 627 Coloradoans who die of a car crash. In 2016, more than 532 who die um, of the flu that year. It's startling statistics uh, in my mind. I want to say another important thing, uh, Lambert County has dropped, opposite of these stats, from 30 to 39. Uh, overdoses in 2016 from 661 in 2013, oh, 39 2016, 61 in 2013, and overdose deaths have tripled in Wild and Douglas counties. This is kind of takes us back to programming and accessibility and training um, of some of these programs that are happening. The coworkers, I would give a lot of credit to um, the individuals that I work with that serve this population who have single-handedly changed that statistic here in Larimer County and hoping to change that in well as well. So are there, like, do the deaths tend to occur more in urban areas or rural areas, or is it just a mix? You know, population would lend us to urban areas, mm -hmm. but it happens, it happens everywhere. It happens in the rural areas as we see it's tripled 
and Weld County in particular. Mm -hmm. And so that's based off of their population numbers. So I would say no. There's a lot of isolation in the rural areas and not a lot of services, and that probably plays a big role. But no, it doesn't necessarily change that. But we know there's more population in like the metro area. Mm -hmm. So you're going to see more. Does it also have to do with so when you talk about socioeconomic? Yeah. When you're looking at, at Lambert County, much higher SES than if you're looking at Weld County. True, but it dropped. So it dropped from. In thir 2013, it was 61. And it's down to 39. So that's the difference. In so that sense. The, I was trying. I was thinking I maybe with the lower socioeconomic, yeah. you might have a higher. Yes, incidents. I think so. Okay, I think so. I would agree as well. And not a lot of accesses. Not a lot of access to resources. Not a lot of services. Not a lot of um, that psychoeducation that we need, which is a big part of the epidemic. Agreed. But it's cool that it's dropping in a time where everywhere else is rising. So that's interesting. So here's just another way to look at it. The darker areas are more overdose deaths by county. So you'll see kind of some of what you're asking, but it's not as, it's not just the higher populated areas. So we see a huge um, darker area here where the epidemic is very intense against areas that aren't getting services here and here. Any questions? Okay. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I'm, um, in another class we talked about historically morphine was used sort of as like a soothing drug that was pretty a common household item. True. True. Um, and so was it common to have? Did you? I just don't hear about like overdose deaths or being a problem in the right. early to mid 1900s. Yeah, I agree. It isn't something we heard a lot about, and it wasn't the same drugs in a lot of ways with fentanyl and a lot of that changing, and it wasn't, uh, it just was so different. All those fact, those intersectionalities weren't all at play, I think, but I hear you. It was, there was more mainstream normalization. It's interesting, in another presentation I do, we do the timeline mm -hmm. of, of use around opioids, and it is fascinating how it used to be and how it is now, and the criminalization also changed things a lot. <laughs> All right. So I just want to make sure you have an understanding. So uh, as we understand, there's layers that create an opioid epidemic, and then there's layers to treat and prevent an opioid epidemic. Again, I don't think it's one thing. I don't think it's isolated in that way. But prevention and treatment have to go hand in hand. We can't even really tease it apart at this point. We've got to serve all sides. We've got to have harm reduction practices, which our research have been prov have proven to be the best practices for treating and preventing um, opioid deaths and the epidemic in general. Naloxone, again, that opioid antagonist, that ability to keep people alive, so then if they want to enter into treatment or um, anything around that, that would be their choice, but they can live through this to get treated. Then we would have fentanyl testing strips, which is new, Larimer County has them, that People can test what they're um, what they're deciding to take, so they are not they don't they can choose not to overdose, which is pretty empowering. Strange access programs, safer injection sites, which has actually been on the Colorado docket. It was last year, um, and it will probably be again. They're pretty controversial, but the evidence shows them as extremely effective. As people, no one has died in a safer injection site, and that's our goal. And people get treatment resources and go go get um, services. Then the um, treatment side of things, medical assisted treatment, you know, we're on point with that. That's where the research is. We need that paired with behavioral therapies and working with people such as myself. But they would be the medication options are Suboxone. We heard of that at all. Suboxone is one that is administered. It has naloxone in it, so it keeps people alive in that sense where they're taking it. And it's a managed, regulated dose with a physician. And then there's Subutex, which decreases cravings. It's very similar to Suboxone. Methadone, is a, a, we've heard for longer. It's been around longer. There's methadone clinics. They're, it, it's tricky for people to access. Um, and people have their own opinions about the addiction that comes with that. But Subutex and Suboxone are kind of where it's at right now. But it, methadone is a, a really uh, 
okay option for lots of people. And then Vivitrol is a big, it's an injectable. It allows like 30 days um, to increase abstinence and it works very well. And then we pair all that with behavioral therapy. So it's very fitting for me as a social worker to talk about this because we need to work with different systems and we all need to work together. So with the harm reduction, I know there's like people, like an argument against some of the harm reduction is that, oh, well, you're just allowing them. True. So what is a good way to respond sure. of why harm reduction is a, like, a positive thing? Like this is better than... Um, the way we intrinsically create change is not um, often from outside reinforcement. Sometimes those work for a little while. Maybe mm -hmm. you get in trouble, you change your behavior for a little bit because you don't want to get in trouble. I mean, we know that, those consequences in the schools. But long term, change comes from an intrinsic place. And so we have to teach and give skills for us to tap into that intrinsic desire to change. And harm reduction does do that. But it gives a lot more space and breath to get there. But the goals are still the same. The goals are still to reduce harm. It's like safety belts, right? Like we all put on seat belts when we get in the car because we're reducing our harm of an accident. That's totally the same idea for harm reduction. It's just, it's a safety belt. We need to keep people alive. We need to keep them coming in. So then we can, when they're ready or when they're starting to show signs, we can have that conversation. We can get them to treatment, say, or we can get them to that therapist or over to that doctor. Because now we have a relationship. We kept them in the door. We met them where they were at. We heard them out. We sat with them when it wasn't working. Kept them alive. And then we get them to treatment. So the safety belt, I guess. Yeah. That's a great analogy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it is. I mean, that's what it is. We, we can think of a lot of analogies like that, but the safety belt is one of my favorites. So, but it gets a lot of pushback. So thank you for bringing that up. So the epidemic in schools. This is grounded very much in what you all know. We know that it affects systems, the epidemic. It affects families, peers, society, and they all intersect. We get that reality. We get that in schools, it's a big place for prevention. We can get, we have an opportunity to pro provide some education or risk potentials to kind of change that trajectory. Education, of course, on addiction could be done. And mainly referrals and collaboration. As we don't need to, as teachers, you know, we don't need to work alone. We can work with the school counselor or the school social worker or connect and staff a case. So the Department of Education talks about the strategies for how we as teachers and school administrators <coughs> should respond to the opioid epidemic. And I just quoted from their web page, basically, and it says that it's our job as teachers to create a safe space. And that's one thing we led with at the beginning. And a positive culture for students. We know that. That's a big grounding factor in our work as educators. And then we have to educate students and their families on the dangers of drug use and how to prevent the opioid misuse and addiction. Just maybe bring in people. We don't have to do it alone. And many evidence-based prevention programs do exist for schools to bring in. Um, we have a colleague who is a dean of um, a social worker, but she's also a dean of students at a high school, and she does a lot of preventive education around addiction because she has a lack as well. So it's very um, licensed addictions counselor. So it's very interesting that there's all kinds of evidence-based work out there. And schools can obviously mitigate risk factors and create that um, connection. We can create more protective factors to boost, to change those intersectionalities. We can prepare, schools and administrations can prepare for an opioid overdose on school grounds. And I'm thinking family too. I think that's a big piece of that. And schools and school districts can support students in recovery and students who have families affected by addiction. And that's a big piece is how do we come from a bit of a harm reduction place to support people to recover, which means they have to say that they were using. They have to say it out loud. And until we can have a place for people to say it out loud, it's hard for us to change this epidemic. That's my favorite quote. Education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. And so I have a question for you all to just take a few notes, and I know you're doing your notes for DD, but what are you, what's going to sit with you? And then what do you need to do in your role, whatever your role is as in the education system, to address the opioid epidemic? Something little. 
just write down a couple of little things that you can do to find a way to make an impact. Something small, again, you don't have to do it tomorrow, but I like to set intentions after we have conversations, because we know how it is. We want to make sure and take this forward. Questions? What was it that you said that they combined that made them worse? Fentanyl? Fentanyl. Yeah. Yeah, it's 50 to 100 times stronger than morphine. Very dangerous. And it's, it's being put into different drugs, and people are getting it from medical facilities and using it that way. Did you, I read, I think this just happened like a week or two ago, that the FDA just approved a drug that's even stronger than fentanyl. Oh and I was wondering why they, I mean, did you have any knowledge of that or I why they would do that? that? No, and yeah, I don't know. It yep, just I seems weird in the middle of all of this that they would put something even more powerful out there. Mm -hmm. It's concerning because yeah. we know that that goes all kinds of places. We saw in that um, the pictures, you can't even see. The drugs are so powerful you can't even see them and they're the same as um, what people are used to. So it's dangerous. So do you, um, the uh, opioids that people get addicted on uh -huh. that were prescribed to them lead to um, seeking out heroin? Sometimes, if they, have, if they lose access, like so say the accident one, you lose access to that medication because you know, the doctor won't prescribe it anymore. It was more of a short term. Sorry, did you Oh, you're fine. It's more of a short term um, deal. Then sometimes people will seek it because it's accessible, less expensive, a lot of places and a lot of times. And um, there's not a lot of options with the physiological. Heard something that that was that a lot of heroin addicts started out. The majority that that I work with, yes, that's the story. Something happened. And then here we are. It wasn't that the intention. I want to do kind of like a fact checking thing yeah. because I have some uh, friends, family that are in medical industries. And sure. They say that when people are coming, when you actually have to use naloxone mm -hmm. and they're coming down off of that overdose, yeah. they would rather die. Like it's a horrible, horrible experience. Sure, sure. People might say that, yeah. So it shoots you into an instant, instant withdrawal, like immediately, the most severe withdrawal, because every, all of those opioids have been stripped off your receptor, so they're not there, and your body needs them. Yeah. So it's not like, you know, a lot of people use opioids to be well. I'm sure we've heard that. It's not that they're using to get high. They're using to be okay, and that's what happens over time, and they're not even okay because those have been stripped off. So a lot of times, if you give, uh, if you administer naloxone, it's best to get out of the way because there's a, you can get hurt. Yeah. So what is the like the actual chemistry or like the naloxone? Do you know? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I know that it's an antagonist and it kicks okay. it off the receptor. Yeah. I know that much, but I don't know. Okay. The, well, I'm envisioning chemistry, and I no. But it's <laughs> it's. <laughs> It's an antagonist, so it does the opposite, right? Yeah. It blocks it. Yeah. Oh, I forgot. Where's that? So with the naloxone, like if you administer it, like is it an injection type of thing? Yeah, there is one that's an injection, but now they have a nasal spray, okay. which is amazingly helpful because people are often intimidated by an injectable. We have a picture of the chemistry. Excited. <laughs> Our organic chemistry girl here, right? <laughs> you can come along with me. organic chemistry. I'm really interested in That's awesome. Yeah, that's what blocks it. And it's like, again, yeah. I might not, I might not. like this of Utex, is that going to be like a replacement? Yeah. More or less? Yeah. The, yep. It plays okay. on the same receptors. It does the same thing, okay. but it regulates, and we can kind of change that dosing down okay. to wean them off. So same with methadone, same with Suboxone. They're all playing on the same opioid receptors in our brain, but they are doing it a little bit differently, and they're allowing it to be managed and reduced is the goal. Mm -hmm. And function. Does it, because I know a lot of like opioids and um, have the dopamine response, mm -hmm. does that, do the drugs like still play with the dopamine response, but like slowly? Yeah. I mean, okay. Exactly, but you know, of course, that's hard on people. 
you know, because yeah. it's not the same. Mm -hmm. And that's why we want to do the behavioral therapies and yeah. do some other things to support that. So it isn't just like you start and you do A, B, C, and D and you're off. It looks very different for every individual because of a lot of the factors. We want people to be successful, so sometimes they'll be on it for a little bit longer to make that effective for them. So are other countries suffering from the same addiction? Yes, other countries um, handle it pretty differently. So safer injection sites, um, syringe access programs, um, naloxone, all of those say in Canada and other places have been used for a long, long time and they don't have the epidemic, the deaths, because they, they were kind of ahead of it in those ways. So the Netherlands, Denmark, those places, they're, they're, they don't have the epidemic. People aren't dying because the prevention kind of has been in place. The Netherlands has an actual neighborhood. Yeah, they could. My husband's been by there. <coughs> yeah. And he said, it's, it's, you can just tell. You can tell you're in that neighborhood. You can tell that people there are addicted. Mm -hmm. And then there's all kinds of places mm -hmm. that they can go to get help. Yeah. So they, they actually kind of isolate it within the city. Mm -hmm. And there's probably lots of safer injection sites right in that arena where nurses are staffed and mm -hmm. um, people such as myself are there and people are not dying. Mm -hmm. so that's the difference. What are the statistics of like teens and like under 18 and like over 18 deaths? Like, is it more one way or the other? More over 18. Definitely, we see that. We see a progression maybe happening in those younger ages, as we see in any addiction, kind of like a build. Maybe there was trauma, maybe there's some other social pieces, which I'm excited for all the social research to come out, because I think we're going to see a lot of that work around adolescents and peers. Well, we should have less, too, because I don't think physicians, and maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think physicians are putting yeah. young kids on, you know, Morphine and yeah. things, those kinds of painkillers for those kids, so I don't think we would see it as much. Mm -hmm. The struggle is we do see them put on a lot of anti-anxiety medications, yeah. which are benzoids, which do, can create the same response because your brain needs it in the same way. So that's, that's where I think we'll see some um, problems if people are choosing to not take that or do not have access to that. But as of today, people I have a class, and sometimes that I TA, and at the end, what they uh, have a debate, and in the past we de debated decriminalization of opiates. Uh -huh. Do you know what the legal status is on that right now? Yeah, so like I said, Colorado's kind of leading the front with the safer injection sites. That's one of the steps. So the Swins Access programs were a big feat that happened in 2012 in Colorado. And now they're going for the safer injection site. So it's not happening on a national level, but state by state are making a lot of different decisions. And Colorado has done a lot, as we know, to decriminalize a lot of different substances and change a lot of that trajectory. So we'll see what happens. But no, I federally, it, that's not happening. So out of what percentage of, um, of people who are addicted to opioids are able to become unaddicted. Yeah, treatment stats. Mm -hmm. It's successful. It's successful, but a lot of programs don't have a lot of success, so that's interesting. A lot of programs do struggle. Community corrections here in town, which is the best treatment that you can receive in the state of Colorado, is Larimer County Community Corrections, which is like their step down facility from. Um, DOC or different ways of entering, they have the best treatment and their rates are 70 some percent that people are able to not use. But again, that is within the criminal justice system so someone did have to get in trouble to then access that treatment. Where we have a gap is before we're in trouble, how can we do some treatment? And that's coming, I see it coming. The movement is, Longmont has a new program where uh, you can uh, you don't. If you want to not use and you want to enter treatment, you can walk into their police station. Let me be clear, I have no idea if people are starting to do this, and there's a lot of stigma there and safety issues maybe. But you can walk in, you can give your drugs, your paraphernalia, and say you want treatment, and they put you in treatment. So I, that is coming. It will be here soon. So what's the healthcare system as far as the, the monetary, I mean, health insurance and all that? Is that something that's paid for? 
I mean, I can see that yeah. as a barrier for, for people not it's, seeking treatment. It's probably the biggest barrier. The biggest, the second biggest, the biggest barrier are, are there is no treatment unless you're in the criminal justice system. So that's like the biggest barrier. So it costs $18,000 for the Larimer County Community Corrections Program. The state pays for that. So, you, but you're in trouble. If you want private treatment, um, $40,000 on average, and it's typically not covered. It's definitely not covered by Medicaid, and it's typically not covered even by private insurance. But some will compensate and reduce, as we know with any kind of insurance, it'll blow it down. That's a lot of private facilities that have that really excellent, um, like Larimer County Community Corrections, they um, are forty grand. What does the community corrections do that's so different than yeah. some of the other, like, private or independent? They have all evidence-based treatment modalities that they do. They do, it's intensive treatment. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily one timeline for each individual. It could be six months. It could be five years. It depends. And they're managed in every possible way almost so they're getting services for housing they're learning how to pay but that's relearning a lot of life skills mm -hmm. like how to um, pay bills and how to get groceries but then at the same time they're having intensive stirt or, or the acronyms for their intensive groups that are based on evidence-based research treatment and um, they just and their recidivism rates are also very low which is amazing their six months um, reports just people are not returning after going through that program, but it's hard to get in. Even if you're in the criminal justice system, they don't have very many slots. Mm -hmm. For women, it's a whole other epidemic because they have even less slots. They're changing that in Larimer County, but it, it's hard to get in. Yeah, why would, they, oh, yeah. why would they have less slots for women? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, I th yeah, they have significantly less slots. Um, to the point where women, it's hard for them to even access treatment coming out of the criminal justice system because there aren't programs. Larimer County has probably the biggest program in the state. Um, and yeah, they're, they're expanding. They say in two years they're going to triple their women's programming, but they just don't have the slots. As there's less women in the criminal justice system, but also the, the treatment needs are not less. So it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Are there long-term effects? If you like use for an extended period or even a short period and then stop use, is there any sort of? Sure. Uh, yes, and naloxone actually the can give longer term effects too. And the more times you have to use the use naloxone, you can have longer term effects. So it's it's not something that we want to do to our bodies very often. Neither, neither, or use it. For long periods of time, we do have like um, damage, dental damage, of course, is like top of the list, and on and on. Heart conditions, you know, all we could just go down the list of physiological and physical things. One other thing, sorry, yeah, no, but um, no, everyone great. I know with, that has become addicted to opioids mm -hmm. and has stemmed from uh, painkiller prescriptions. Yeah, mm -hmm. and That's so the is there, and usually it's like because they're they were being prescribed and the hospital supplying them. Yeah. yeah. Um, so is there any sort of responsibility on the hospitals? Yeah, I mean that's the fifth that's what the why I kind of talk about the fifth vital sign of pain is changing. So they're changing the medical um, criteria. And again I'm I can't speak like chemistry I can't hundred percent speak to that, but I understand they're changing that fifth vital sign. And so, no, we're not managing pain in the way we did from 1999 to 2016. It has to look different and their expectations. And also, providers, we talk about this from a provider lens, there's so much liability and they're, there's, they're terrified that people are going to become addicted or overdose, you know. And that's another issue where they're not being able to serve people maybe as well as, as we should because of that fear and the liability piece. I have a coworker who does integrated care down in Denver and she works at a training hospital and the providers are just paralyzed with what to do in this era. Do you know how they're changing the pain? Like 
like how they're evaluating it? Or? Yeah. So their pain is so subjective, right? Yes. And, and that's been the problem. Right, so they're no longer evaluating it on that scale system okay. that they used to where, although I, I have seen it within the last couple of years, that system's still being used, but, the, but I hear that they're supposed to be weaning that out and we're not gonna treat pain in those same ways. So they're doing pain management clinics that exist, a lot of education from social workers, behavioral um, therapists that can kind of help better understand what's going on for that individual. We know that takes a lot of time to figure out everyone's individual pain management <coughs> strategies that can be expensive do you see physicians then and well dentists i was in the dental profession before oh yeah i was a teacher but instead of going right to the big guns where they're starting off the yes. slow, they're starting out with the lower because that's what i've seen happen huge shift huge yeah shift. we're not they're not going to that they're not even able able to in a lot of ways because of that liability piece and yeah. the fear piece and the regulation piece that no, they can't just go to prescribe. Um, if you get hurt, you're not leaving with um, medications, that hydrocodone or oxycodone that you used to probably leave with over the last handful of years. Yeah, it's changing. So this will change, and it's how we talk about it that will get it help us. And I think it's hard from the provider's point of it view, is. too, because if you give them you know, a lower dose, it may not control their pain at that point. Yeah. And then you've got the patient that's yeah. ticked off because I yeah. still have the pain. <laughs> and then you're, you know, you're trying to, to do it in levels where you're not using the big guns until you have to mm -hmm. kind of thing. So um, I have friends in the, in the yeah. dental fields that that's happening a lot. You know, take, an, take a couple Advil first yeah. and then call me. Well, I don't want to do that. I want it to go away now. Yeah. Well, you can't have that now. So. Right. It's a different time. It's a different time. It's really hard for providers. So again, it's not one thing. There's lots of reasons why this occurs and lots of ways to shift around it. And it's hard on anyone working in the arena of how to address this. There's a lot of fear. And... I'm just kidding. Any other questions for Danielle? All right. Thank you so much. Yeah. That was. Definitely interesting information, many things that I did not know.